Last week we talked about a key part of what the Pharisees were missing in fulfilling their roles and that key part was mercy. See, and mercy is the key that unlocks the door to hope and that's really how we need to look at this. Mercy is the key that unlocks the door to hope. In other words, when you are merciful to someone else, it has the power to be that which unlocks the door to hope for them. Anything else just closes the door. A couple of years back, I was having dinner with a friend. In fact, my wife and I were there together. And it was one of those dinners, you know, that you have and you get there and you're there all night. In fact, some of the staff stays behind because you're still there after they close the doors. And we were having lots of great conversations and, well, it was getting late and it was time for us to leave. And as uh, we begin to leave, the conversation continues as we walk down uh, the, the little aisle from between all the tables and this is empty restaurant and we walk out uh, the, the, the front door and the conversation spills over into the sidewalk and the street and we're deep in thought. You know how when you're in a conversation some, with someone and you don't want to be interrupted, right? And anytime you're interrupted, you just kind of quickly dismiss it and I think that's where we were. See, and where we were was in, in a downtown area and there were a bunch of shops and other restaurants and really everything was closed down with the exception of a few bars, lounges. And while we're in the middle of a conversation and we're really wrapping things up, there's this man who walks up and he is obviously intoxicated. At least uh, he thought he can continue to have or that he could hold a conversation with someone. And so he interrupts our, our conversation, and I cannot remember anything that he said, but it felt like he was just needing someone to talk to. He wanted to have a, a friend, as it were. And the, 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 the friend that we were with, he's actually a, a, a priest in, in, a, in a, the Orthodox Church, and so it was obvious that he was a religious guy because, you know, they wear different things. I don't know what they're called. And he has a giant necklace around his, his neck with a big cross. And he's a great guy. I, I really admire him in a lot of ways. And so he was obvious that we were Christians, or at least that guy was. I don't know what he thought about me. And so he, he stops and he's trying to have a conversation with us. And what I'm about to tell you is, is, is not meant to be a negative on my friend. Because I know his heart, but I don't know everything behind why he does what he does. And so the guy comes up and he begins to try and talk to us and just have little conversations with us. And we, we kind of go back and engage a little bit, but it's, it's, very, it's, it's, it's really more the, yeah, move on. And so what my friend does, is he says, God bless you. But the guy didn't leave. He kept persisting and wanting to talk. Just, I, I can't remember exactly what he said. But it was obvious that he was intoxicated and the thought came across my mind. It's like, man, I could really have a conversation with this guy because I know where he's at right now. I know, I, I know that uh, there's a reason why he is doing what he is doing. And, uh, but as, the, as our time, we were probably standing there for maybe five minutes, I, you know, the response to the guy was always, God bless you. God bless you. It's almost like sending you off in peace. And I remember it struck me as kind of odd. But what was even worse is that I did not speak up. I didn't step in. I didn't engage this guy. I thought it. But intentions aren't, aren't enough. And, and I didn't engage this, this guy. And then finally he walks away. And he starts walking in the direction that I know that our car is parked. Because, you know, you have to park like 20 blocks away. And I thought, well, once I leave this conversation, maybe we'll meet up with the guy. 
But then the thought crossed my mind because it was late at night. Yeah, but what if this guy tries to rob us? Like, I, don't, I don't know who this guy is. But man, I could have a conversation with him. At least the possibilities were floating around in my mind. None of those things happened. Didn't meet up with the guy. Missed an opportunity. Now you might think, well, I mean, really, what difference would you have made? He might not even remember the conversation. True. But what if? But what if? Could have had a conversation. Who knows the impact that that might have had on that man? Who knows what he would, who knows what that could, who knows what that could have done. See, mercy is the key that opens the door to hope. Now, sure, I'm not, I'm not sure about what I could have done. I'm not sure about the impact that I could have made. But I know that mercy unlocks the door to hope. And I didn't use the key. If it is true that mercy is the key, we have to use it to unlock the door to hope. But I think sometimes we try and, and, and do more uh, like play gatekeepers as it were. Throughout our lives, we come into situations and we like to determine, that, determine like, like, who needs mercy and who deserves hope. Uh, we, we think this way. We, we might even say it. Well, it's a bold to say it. Uh, but we think this way, at least like, you know, when we talk about being merciful and we talk about loving like that, when we talk about going beyond what we, we see and in, 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 in all the labels and the brokenness and, and all the things that we you know, we, how, how we define people, one another and ourselves, and we look and we were able to see that and this is a made in the image of God being. We still, I, I think sometimes we, we still think, well, but that's not everybody, is it? Like, we don't have to love everybody. We don't have, and we come up with scenarios in our minds, right, of, of, of who we don't have to be merciful to during this, who we don't have to love in those times. We do this. Well, ironically, it's the same response Jesus received. In Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 29, this section of scripture was just read for you. A lawyer stands up, right? And he, and he, he puts a test, puts Jesus to test, and he says what? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus tells him, well, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And the man says, well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he rattles this thing off without any thought Much like we do, I think, oftentimes. We speak. We say things. Without really giving thought to the implications and the understanding and the meaning and what's, what we're actually saying. So he just rattles this thing off. He's got the right answer. And so Jesus tells them, you've answered correctly. Do this. And you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, <laughs> but who's my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? See, asking who is my neighbor is another way of saying, but that doesn't include everyone, does it? And in so many ways, when we think this way, it's like we're trying to play God and determine who is deserving. But Jesus responds, don't play God. Reflect him. Then Jesus 
uses this parable of the Good Samaritan, verses 30 through 36, that was read for you. If you don't know it, not familiar with it, I'll just spit it off for you really fast. There's some people who like each other and there's some people who hate each other. In this group, there are two groups of people who hate each other. One of those people gets robbed, beat up pretty bad. Probably could have been left to die. Two people who are supposed to be people who like him, who would even love him, who are part of his clan, his tribe. People who you would expect to stop and help. Leaders, even, religious leaders, people who stand in the presence of God and represent him to the man who's laying on the ground, half dead. Both a priest and a Levite passes by, and neither one of them stop to help. And then a man, who presumably hates him, and he probably hates him too. He sees him, and he stops, and he helps he bandages his wounds and he puts them on his own donkey and he takes them to an inn and he pays for this guy's housing and to help him come back to life essentially and he goes a step further and says hey and if it takes more than this then I'll, I'll cover the cost when I come back. So he had intentions on coming back. Can you imagine can you imagine stopping and helping someone that you don't like? Someone who just gets on your nerves. Someone that you've had a... Could you imagine someone who you get on their nerves doing the same to you? Could you imagine stopping and helping someone and, 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 and that, that you don't like, that you don't get along with, or they doing the same to you. Can you imagine taking them and, and helping nurse them back to life and paying for them? Can you imagine someone doing that to you or you doing that to someone else? Could you imagine being willing to cover the costs? Someone you don't like. Who needs you? In a situation where it would be so easy to be indifferent or just to, I don't know, look the other way. Can you imagine? Well, that's what mercy does. That's what mercy does. It does away with the indifference and the turning a blind eye and it responds with compassion that's one of the main things that we receive from this parable and Jesus says reflect God the Samaritan reflected God and so maybe maybe you get the point but it really doesn't resonate with you well maybe this one will a candidate was running for office and fell into the hands of political enemies who stripped the candidate's credibility and integrity, berated the candidate verbally, and went away, leaving the candidate dehumanized and the nation divided. Now by chance, an activist of the same party was going down that road, and when he saw the candidate, he passed by on the other side because the candidate wasn't ideologically pure. So likewise, an elected official of the same party, when he came to the place and saw the candidate, passed by on the other side, not wanting to be dragged down by the reputation of the candidate. But an activist of the opposition party, while traveling, came near the candidate, and when he saw the candidate, he was moved with pity. He went to the candidate, bandaged the candidate's wounds, having asked for forgiveness for his own past dehumanizing statements and offering a prayer of peace. Then he put the candidate on his own prayer list, gave the candidate respect all humans deserve, and took care to ensure that he only spoke respectfully of the candidate even when they disagreed about policy. The next day, he wrote two articles, posted them on social media that said, take care of this candidate, for the candidate may win. And we will need to be a country that espouses forgiveness, mercy, peace, and love in order to face the challenges that will come. Or maybe that didn't resonate with you. Maybe you just don't see yourself as a political person. Maybe 
you're just done with all of that. Okay, so maybe this one, this one will. Once there was a certain businessman who worked in downtown Nashville. He, each day on his lunch hour, he would walk a few blocks up the street to eat at a nice restaurant. One day, as he was passing a certain alleyway, someone grabbed him by the arm and dragged him into the alley. Two men began to beat this businessman without mercy. They took his money. They took off all of his clothes. They threw him into a dumpster. They left him to die. The businessman was bleeding badly. He struggled to get out, but he could not. And all he managed to do was wallow around in the stinking filth until he sunk to the bottom. Then he laid his head down and he passed out. Now this, this dumpster was not far from the street and several people who passed by heard moans coming from this dumpster. Their day was already planned out to the last detail so they had no time for such nonsense as helping some bum who had fallen into a dumpster. And so not just one but many people passed on by and ignored the noise. Most of these people were very religious. They attended church every week. They tied their money so the church could help poor and less fortunate people like him. Finally, an old bum came stumbling down the alley. He was looking in all the dumpsters, hoping to find some discarded food. He heard the moans too, and since he had nothing else to do, he decided to investigate. See, to this man, this was an adventure for him, a welcome break in his day, after all, he didn't often hear a dumpster moan. He carefully lifted the lid, being ready to run at the first sign of danger. But all he saw was a naked man with trash and filthy scum stuck to his body. He kind of snickered and said, Fella, you know you can't live in dumpsters, don't you? But all he heard in reply was more moaning. Finally, the bum realized the man wasn't drunk, just badly hurt. So with great difficulty, he dragged the man out the dumpster. He slapped the man on the face a few times, but the man wouldn't wake up. He only moaned. And the, the, the bum thought to himself, this is all I need. More problems in my life. One more thing to deal with. But he knew if he left the man here, he would probably die. So he grabbed the man by the arms and dragged him to the street. He waved at the cab, and as he was putting the man in the, driver, in the cab, the driver started yelling at him, saying, what am I supposed to do with him? The bum replied, take him to the nearest hospital. But the cabbie demanded, I, I have to get paid. Nobody rides for free. And the bum reached into his pocket, pulled out all of his money, $2 and some change, that was all he had after standing on the road all day long, holding his little sign. He had been looking forward to a nice evening, maybe some food, maybe some beer. He offered the money to the cabbie, saying, is this enough? The cabbie looked at it, and his heart softened a little. And he said, yes, that is enough. And off the cab went to the nearest hospital. Or maybe this one might speak to you a little more. An elderly couple was mugged and robbed by a group of thieves outside a restaurant in Dallas as they were walking to their car. As the couple lay dazed and bleeding on the sidewalk, a minister walked toward them on his way to church. But instead of stopping to render aid, he crossed to the other side of the road and continued on his way. A short while later, a group of Christians came along, but since they were running late to their prayer meeting, they also crossed over and hurried on, the, on their way. Finally, an agnostic came along and felt compassion for the couple. He rendered whatever medical aid he could and helped them into his van, drove them to the nearest hospital. He paid the deductible cost of their insurance and made arrangements to further pay any amount not covered by their policy. Luke ten thirty six. Jesus says, which of these do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? And verse 37, the lawyer who stood up and asked these things, he said, and seemingly reluctant to even specifically mention the term Samaritan, he says this, 
the one, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, what? You go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. And when you go and you do likewise, we are reflecting the heart of God. We're reflecting God. Think about it. We, we all, we're, we're all sinners. We're loved and we are forgiven by God. And we're called to treat others with the same mercy and the same respect, the same compassion, the same love, no matter who they are. As disciples of Jesus, we don't just know things about him. We reflect him. We reflect God. And having received his mercy with gratitude, we stand and we transmit the same mercy that we have received ourselves and continue to receive we do it to everyone criminal or saint rich or poor male or female Christian or Buddhist gay or straight Christian or atheist when it comes to mercy when it comes to mercy, there is no criteria, there are no labels, there are no identities that can hold mercy back. Because mercy removes them all. Trump's judgment. That's the kind of mercy that reflects God. And I'm thankful that God's mercy is not based on labels identities criteria because none of us would have it go and do likewise Father God we're grateful for this time together we're thankful for days that we can come and reflect upon you together as as a family and I pray that as we continue to reflect on loving like you looking at the examples of Jesus and how he actually loved, how he literally actually loved. We acknowledge that there are times where we, we don't even compare. We struggle. I pray that you would strengthen us in the moments to love like that. May we reflect you in all we do. It's in Jesus we pray.